My name is Howard Rollenhagen. When I joined the Army, I had to use my first name, which was Ernest Rollenhagen. So I am known as Ernest and Howard, depending on what time frame people got acquainted with me. I got a friendly letter from the government that was mailed June 5th, 1944, telling me I was due to be inducted in the Army on the 15th of June. I was drafted as a Seventh-day Adventist conscientious objector, which would give me a few rights later on. We got on a bus in Muskegon on the 5th of June, on the 15th of June, and went to Detroit. And from there, we got on a train and went to Camp Grant, Illinois. I spent uh, from June until uh, sometime in mid-August in basic training. Actually, it took us about three weeks of that time to do the real basic training. The rest of the time was time killing, such as cutting grass with razor blades, uh, laying out in the sunshine and doing some calisthenics, uh, anything to kill time to get their time schedule coordinated to move us on. This included, well, we had 25 mile pack uh, forest marches in, within a given time zone we did it twice, once with a light pack and once with a full field pack. I think we made the 25 miles in four hours. It was, it was tough because you're on a, on a pretty fast trot all the way. During that short stay there, one or two days was army uh, training on your belly going th through obstacle courses and stuff, carrying a gun. And they wanted me to carry one and I said no. So they wanted me to carry a facsimile of a gun that was just a cut out piece of wood. And I refused that too. They got pretty disturbed when I refused to stick. But during that time, killing time, they also made us go through the infiltration course the third time because the first two time records weren't too good, so they said. And the third time we went through, it was raining. Now, you, when infiltration course means going about 500 feet over obstacles and whatnot with live fire going over your head, 18 inches off the ground. And if you didn't believe it, you look on the other side of the river and you could see these bullets pop in the clay bank. You could see the poof in the, in the soil across the, across the river. We were on this side going downhill a little bit. The rifles were shooting 18 inches. They were mounted on a tripod like that, 
so they could swivel level. Get on your belly and crawl. I really think that the rifles were manned and carefully watched because I did see a couple of guys go berserk there and get up and start running. They didn't get hurt. So I think there was enough safety there, but it was a threat that worked. Anyway, we then were transferred to Billings Hospital in Indianapolis for parallel training, they called it, in the medical field. And I was not prepared for medics. I was a machinist by trade, but they, we, because I was the, an Adventist, they put us in medics. We had about six weeks of training, though we were there about possibly 10 weeks. Then we moved, then they broke us up the classes were maybe 150 in each room. They broke us up and, and doubled, us, doubled it up with the other classes so that there were about 50 or 60 of us that went to Martinsburg, West Virginia, an army hospital that was receiving patients mainly from Europe. At that time, we had hands-on training of how to take care of these patients, take care of their wounds and their daily needs, and try to uh, subdue a few because they wanted to get out of there. But anyway, we. From there, after this was getting toward the end of November, no, early November, they gave us a train ticket to Fort Lewis, Washington. We had 10 days to get there. We could stop off along the way for a furlough time at home at our own expense, which I took advantage of. I got to Chicago and went from Martinsburg to Chicago and then grabbed a train to Muskegon to be with my family. Let me re back up here. I was inducted just before 26 years of age, because the Army um, was accepting, or should I say conscripting, uh, uh, drafting people up to 36 previous to this time. And they just changed the law to tra draft only people at 26, so they grabbed 80 of us from Muskegon out of the 100 that was drafted that were approaching 26 to get a, be sure they got us in there before we slipped over the line. So I was drafted when I had a three-year-old child and it was heartbreaking. Now where was I? On furlough. I stopped in Muskegon to be with the family for seven or eight days. 
and I did some construction work on the house to help my wife endure the time alone. And spent days with my little three-year-old <clears throat> and had to leave and go to Fort Lewis by train on the Great Northern route, which was the old steam trains. They had some kind of a, a electric train going through tunnels. And we landed in Seattle and headed for Fort Lewis a couple days before Thanksgiving. Then there at Fort Lewis, we were killing time. Well, the Army headquarters was organizing and getting us in the in the pipeline to be shipped overseas. And during that time, we were organized into general hospital units, three of them at that time, 317, 318, and 319. I ended up in 318. That's a general hospital unit of 450 enlisted men. That's much bigger than a regular army company. Uh, and we had doctors and nurses in addition to that, and I cannot tell you the number. It probably 60 to 75 doctors. And we trained there as in this big unit of 450. <clears throat> that meant KP was quite a chore. And in order for me to get Sabbaths off, which the regular Staff, uh, not the staff sergeant, the, I can't say his name anymore, the sergeant in charge of the complete unit, they had staff sergeants to take care of individual prob, uh, sections or details. But I cannot remember his name. He was a redhead fellow and almost as old as I was. And he gave me no Sabbath problem. All he did say is, you have Sabbath off, you report for KP on Sunday. That meant getting up at four o'clock in the morning because we had a much bigger mess hall than normal and it took a lot more doing. This four o'clock in the morning quite often meant starting to peel four bushel of potatoes. Not alone, I had a helper, but you sat there on a chair and peeled two bushels of potatoes, it's quite back-breaking even at that. <laughs> anyway, from there on, we, we bivouacked in February in Fort Lewis in freezing weather at night and cold weather in the daytime and some snowing because we were in the foothills of Mount Rainier or where we bivouacked. And believe it or not, four men in their four shelter halves stuck together to make a pup tent, sleeping overnight, and raining and freezing on the outside, 
and four men breathing inside, building up frost. Those pup tents were solid structures in the morning. You had to pull the stakes and tip it over to get out from under it. A good friend of mine, Bob Guthrie, who was from Berrien Springs at that time, an Adventist, was in the motor pool on our Adventist or our General Hospital unit. And so he was on the motor pool for getting supplies at that time. And he advised me to volunteer to go on details in the morning with the trucks to go get the supplies because that meant when we got the supplies back to our uh, bivouac area, we would break open these crates, boxes and stuff and burn the trash and we could get near the fire and warm up a bit because we were in this r drizzle rain of Fort Lewis area and we didn't have, to have a dry stitch on us, even though it was pretty cool. And we'd stand to the back to the fire and the steam would roll. So I learned to, that volunteering in the Army isn't always bad if you know what you're doing. <laughs> we finished our bivouac area and still our orders for deployment were not ready. So they shipped us about the end of February to Fort Ord, California for amphibious training. In Fort Ord, California, when we arrived there, was very cool at night and very hot in the daytime, and it was difficult to dress in uniform to meet those two situations because when we'd go into town for Sabbath, uh, we needed suntans because it was hot in the, in the valley there, but out over the hump at the ocean sea shore, it was quite cool and we needed wolves. We tried it both ways, but we were only there four or five weeks and we got through it. Then we went back to Camp Grant and stayed a couple of weeks doing nothing but killing time, calisthenics, and grass cutting with those razor blades and a few marches, just anything to keep us occupied until we shipped off to Seattle for boarding ship, which eventually happened on Mother's Day, first Sunday of May, I think it is. And we spent six days on the ship, uh, on the sea. And we were in Honolulu on a Sunday morning, anchored early, and our unit got off quite early and headed toward some other organization that fed us Sunday dinner. And immediately after dinner, we went to our barracks, which was at um, the place we were at Schofield Barracks. It come to me now. Schofield Barracks was about 16 miles uphill from Honolulu. 
if I remember right, it was Northwest. That was a permanent army installation, brick and mortar structure. And we took uh, a unit of permanent army installation that had not been used and they pointed their finger and said, that's where you are to be. Immediately we had to pitch in and clean the dust out of the building. De various details went to supply to get equipment to set up bunks and all what's needed to live there including rations. Other details went to the sh ship and got our unloaded supplies. We worked very hard, practically under the whip, because we knew we were having an air convoy coming from the Pacific with over a hundred patients, which would be there by seven o'clock that evening. And we were ready. By seven o'clock, we had our various medical clinics set up. And I was, by that time, assigned to the Plaster Paris detail of removing all the casts from every patient that arrives. We were supposed to have them off and ready for doctor's inspection within 12 hours. Now when you have an air convoy with two to three hundred patients arriving at one time, that's almost an impossible chore with four men working in plaster. But we did our best. That first night, with those 200 that arrived, 200 plus, that arrived, and sub others subsequently, we worked a 36-hour shift that first in time, and they brought meals to us. I was dead on my feet, let alone backbreaking from bending over these patients, taking off plaster Paris casts, which quite often were soggy and would not cut because they crumbled. They use crinoline gauze, crinoline. That's a very stiff mesh stuff like screen. And they embed plaster. We wipe the plaster in on a hard table so that it, the plaster covered the crinoline both sides so you couldn't see the stuff. And then rolled it and soaked these rolls and picked them up so that it was a roll a mush to roll it on the pl patient, but the crinoline gave it the reinforcement to hold it together so it couldn't crack. When plaster got wet, this crinoline is very tough stuff, and it does not cut well with scissors. So you're trying to nibble with scissors and Plaster is still in the way, so you knock some more plaster out of the way and get some more scissors in there. It's very time consuming to get it off. We had no electric tools, we did everything by hand. But we got through it. Then I was having Sabbath off and working long details, the KP in the morning 
by that time and then go to the hospital when the clinic opened and work the rest of the day in plaster. One Sabbath morning, <clears throat> I was in the mess hall with my pass in my hand and, the, and dressed to leave immediately. And the PA sounded off code blue in the orthopedic section. That meant where I, that's where I was working. So I dropped my breakfast and volunteered to go up there. And they had a patient that was hemorrhaging inside of the plaster cast. And it was a big body spiker. That's where your, the body is wrapped in at least two extremities. It was an arm and a leg wrapped, as well as the full body. And we had to get that thing off of him as quick as possible. Well, this had been going on for, it had been seeping for several hours before it broke into the hemorrhage. And the pl plaster was soft, but the crinoline was tough. And we had to chew that thing off. The two of us, one in front and one in back. And we got it off. And I turned to my sergeant and he said he was very grateful. And he gave me a big thank you for taking the time off because he knew that it was, I had the right to leave if I wanted to. I had the pass, I could have ignored the call. But from then on, we were the best of buddies. There was no more snapping or anything. We went on, we folded up operations about the end of June and they, to kill time, they sent us off into the northeast part of the island for jungle training. And there we were, did night operations crawling from tree to tree in the night with no flashlights. These were banya trees, the, the, the things that the limbs dropped down and touched the ground and, and re-root. Re re so, and it makes a new tree then from the other way up. And we could travel over in those branches probably a thousand feet sometimes. But you had to have test every motion you make, test it for strength for your hands first, and then test with to support weight before you really step. And you're doing this in the dark with a little bit of moonlight and starlight and no noise try to make no noise. So that's what we did for several nights. We also pitched uh, hospital tents, which were three poles, three poles upright in the center. Pitched them at night in darkness And then we were prepared for everything. They were ready to go to the Pacific. But they killed time until 
just past the middle of August. And we went to Honolulu to board ship. Previous to this, the day before, they collected all cameras, field glasses, radios, and everything to put it in a sealed cargo container for safe shipping. So they said. And the next day we got on the ship and our group got on very early, maybe 5.30 in the morning. This was later August and it was, I would say maybe 20 minutes after daybreak. Our group was 400, and they put on lots of other groups <clears throat> so that it totaled about 3,500 into a converted troop ship. These were the bunks welded into the ship as close as they could put them and still get to them. I don't think there was 18 inches of space to walk between the bunks. From floor to ceiling, about every that far apart. Well, they got the thing loaded and we pulled out about six o'clock in the evening. When we got out to sea so that we could hardly see the statue there at the Honolulu Harbor, the PA system came on to tell us that the European theater had closed. No, the Japanese had given up. I missed that. It was the European theater that we left the States on. And it was the Japanese theater had given up the day that we had, that is, they hadn't signed it, but they had agreed to, the day in August. Well, if we were closer to shore, I'm sure quite a few would have jumped over. <laughs> anyway, we went to the Pacific in convoy that meant slow going, but it was a big group with little Navy ships around us to protect us from, they hoped to protect us from mines. Mine sweepers were all around. We got to Guam and I think we refueled there because I remember we stayed about three days Maybe it was other ships to refuel, I do, can't remember. And then we started on again. We got to Okinawa and they told us we had to get off because our ship was too big to get into Japan. It was too deep in the water and the Japanese waters were too, too mined to be safe. So we all got off the ship, everybody. And our, our medical cargo was lifted by cargo nets and a hoist out of the hold, over the side, and put into two and a half ton amphibious vehicles. And one of our group was assigned to each vehicle that carried our cargo. And this meant we went to shore 
and rode to the marine compound that was fenced and we had to get off at the gate and sat on waiting benches there while the truck went further in and they, the Marines, unloaded the stuff. So actually, we couldn't watch it at, after that point. Well, about the second or third day of unloading this kind of thing, no, it was longer than that. It took about 10 days to totally unload our stuff because we had to button hatches and go buck the wind for various storms. They were heavy, heavy winds and a lot of rain. So the holes always had to be buttoned down pretty tight. Anyway, we, find we were not quite through and a new second lieutenant was added to our group. And he was his pad and pencil, determined that not all of our stuff was at the Marine base like it should be. So he boarded our ship on a Sunday morning and put our group in the hold because we were not doing a good job. This meant about 20 of us. I think there was only one other Adventist in this particular detail that I was in to the riding this ship, this amphibious boat to, to shore. But we took it as a joke because we knew that we could talk our, out of it, talk ourselves out of it because they did not give us full responsibility to watch this stuff. We only watched it from the boat to the shore. The Marines did it after that. Well, after possibly three days, It finally got to the uh, commander of our unit who came down and released us and, rele and removed all records of our imprisonment. <laughs> then we got to shore. We set up a brand new tent, a squad tent. I think there were six guys in each tent. And about the second day, they told us at noontime to button down. This was on Sunday we got off. And I think it was Tuesday. They told us to button down our tents as tight as we could and secure it because a big windstorm, possibly typhoon, was going to hit, which it did, starting about one o'clock in the afternoon. The winds came and the rains came. And it looked hopeless. And it became hopeless about four o'clock in the afternoon, the water was coming off the hillside, overflowing the ditch that we had dug and running through under our tents. And because the soil was so soft when we pitched tent, we put the upright poles on orange crate ends and they were setting on this mush and all of a sudden when the wind hit and the tent 
bowed in like a big sail. The pole leaned enough to slip off that orange crate head and drop in the mud. And it dropped in possibly three feet. Well, the ridge pole wouldn't take that because the ridge pole was sitting on those big spikes on top of the poles. The ridge pole broke and the winds, the ridge pole stabbed the peak of the tent when the next big wind came. And then the hole got bigger and the wind got inside and so we decided to lash, leave a couple of bunks on the ground, put our duffel bags on top of the bunks, put another bunk on top of that upside down, lash it together with the ropes we could find, and we collapsed the tent to make a big enough mass, hoping that it would lay on the ground and protect things, which it did. But we had to find shelter for ourselves. And we took the fly off the top, the extra fly off the top of the tent and went over to an empty Jeep that had already lost its top. And we sat in that Jeep with the fly wrapped around us for a while. And all of a sudden a big wind came and that took the canvas and bent the stanchion of the, with the windshield and everything and the, everything was gone. We were sitting in the open again. By this time it was twilight. And one of the guys had seen on the, one of the hillside trails up there that there were some native tombs carved in the side of the hill into the little caves. And he had seen some of them that were, had been opened during the war or as a result of war. He said, let's go to them, which we did. There were six of us. For that were sitting in that Jeep. And we went up that hillside and found that open tomb, crawled in and stuck the stone back in front of it. And we sat there through the windstorm and the typhoon with water dripping on us until maybe 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. By that time, the storm was over passed and we went outside it was so still it almost hurt your ears but we had to stay on our feet and walk because it turned cooler this was already October and we were soaked to the skin and we stayed on our feet until morning. Just keep walking, talking, walk back and forth. Didn't know where we were, but we wouldn't get too far away in the darkness so that we could know where we were. In the morning, they scrambled around and somehow got us a late breakfast and a mid-afternoon lunch that took care of us for that day. And the supplies got reorganized and we got new tents and our duffel bags were salvageable so we didn't lose any clothes. But we got new tents and then when the details came to go up on the hillsides and pick up debris around the 6th Army Post Office, 
which was about a mile from where we were encamped. The post office was uh, Quonset Buildings, and it was on a high ridge like we had been, and from where we were, we could see it blow up in the afternoon when the winds were so strong. It would r rattle some of that metal until one sheet would get loose, and after at least one sheet would get loose, the building was on its way out because they flattened. There was nothing left of them. Well, we went up there and picked up mail for, I'm going to say, possibly 10 days. Walking those hillsides, picking up any piece of white material and bringing it back in a, in a small knapsack over our shoulder and the post office department and the guys assigned to it were diligently trying to dry this up and try to put anything together if they could find a name on it. Well, it came, this was a early October, possibly the 5th, when that typhoon hit. By the end of October, some small ships became available and we reloaded and headed for Japan and got to Japan, I'm going to say about the 10th. I have no record. We unloaded our material and then they broke us up and sent us to various details. I was first sent to a field hospital and a uh, clinic detachment that was just taking care of small incidentals during the day that were not to be hospitalized. And we took care of both medic, uh, enlisted men and civilians that would get hurt in that area. Then they d decided to, because we got to Japan one day later than 319, I was assigned as a replacement for three, in the 319th hospital because by this time it was getting Thanksgiving and a little past and we were to replace the ones that were going out of 319 on point system, which was something new. So I spent about a month doing detail in 319. And on New Year's Eve, going through Chow Line, they gave everybody a Schick test because diphtheria was coming around in the native hillsides. And this was as we were going into the line. As I come out of the line, I started to feel bad, feel ill. And the more I walked toward my bunk, the sicker I got. And so I turned around and I went to the dispensary. And I do not remember getting there. 
somebody picked me up and finished taking me. And by that time, my fever was sky high and I was losing consciousness, had lost consciousness. <clears throat> well, they didn't know what to do. So they shipped me back to our unit, 319, as a patient. Well, I hadn't signed in as a patient. I hadn't signed out of our detachment. So I was suddenly called AWOL. I was AWOL in my own unit. But they brought me around after a day or two. I went back down to our detachment. Living quarters was attached right to the hospital building where we were doing duty. And in my bathroom, I walked down to my detachment to see if I had mail. And the sergeant yelled at me as I passed the orderly door, where have you been? We have you AWOL. Sorry, but I passed out and they took me. So I didn't get called. AWOL was wiped off my record too. But I got my mail and went back to the clinic and they decided that I would, after about 10 days, I had recovered and they decided to try this test at a one-tenth strength to see if it was really that that did it or if something else was it. And they gave it to me at four o'clock in the afternoon and by six I was back in the hospital for the second go round. So then they decided they had no room for me to work in the hospital because there were Japanese natives working there doing uh, general duty work and um, possibly they could bring something that I would pick up. And since I could not stand this medicine, they would have nothing to treat me with. So by the 20th of January, I became quarantined. And I was stayed in the hospital fifth floor of the hospital with no street clothes, just pajamas and s slippers until they could arrange transportation to get me back to the States. And it had to be by hospital ship, not troop transport, because they were afraid of me and my medical condition. So I came back to the States on the Ernestine Corunda hospital ship that left Japan I'm going to say early March. I remember it took us 33 days to get back to Seattle because they had to repair the boiler on the ship while we drifted at sea for four days. No lights. When the boiler went down, there was no lights. Just emergency lights from batteries. And I landed in the States about the 1st of May and was sent to
the Army Hospital at In Illinois, just east of Burlington, Iowa, about 40 or 50 miles. I can't say that name. That's the best I can say, isn't it? And while there, they didn't know what to do with me either. They couldn't give me any antitoxin for the diphtheria, and yet I had been in an area that was that way, and they were afraid to turn me loose for fear I would come down. So they kept me there until 5th of June. I was released or discharged on the 5th of June, 46, I was in the Army 10 days short of two years. I never carried a gun because I was a Seventh-day Adventist conscientious objector. If anybody gave me a hard time, that's the only thing I had to use. And uh, I was in the books I was classified as 1AO. In Japan, the duty sergeant would try to assign me various things, and because I had Sabbath off, he would stick me with KP or dirty details. And always try to get me onto a detail that would impinge on this Friday evening. And I'd confront him. And he says, well, you're in the army now. I said, yes, but the army accepted me. I was drafted, the army accepted me under these conditions. And it got me through. <laughs>